Hi, everyone, and welcome. Hello, hello. Sorry, I'm going to mute those. Um, we'll have some time later on for you to unmute yourself, but please don't unmute yourself unless, uh, unless in, in, until the time has come. Uh, so if you look here, we had a question, and for those of you just, just joining us, you're, well, you're welcome to answer that question as well. Sorry about that. It looks like that, actually. I'm having some technical issues here tonight, but you can click on this link right here, and you can answer that question. What is your Jewish dating secret that you like to share in two words? And we have so many amazing answers here tonight. You can see honesty is the number one that comes out. So the bigger the word, it means the more people used it. So you have honesty. We have, we have uh, happiness. We have companion. We have listen. We have love. So just take a moment to kind of, and it's kind of updating live as you answer your questions. So take this all in. This is our collective dating advice this evening. So take a look at this right here and you can see all of your answers collectively. Quite amazing. Vulnerability skills, open-mindedness, have fun, success, companion, remember, be strong, understanding. So this is our, our collective dating advice. Tonight, I'm very happy to have with me a dating coach, Annie Newman. And we're going to start this evening with a discussion. But before we do that, what I'd like to do for you is um, I'd like to just open up with a couple of very interesting things. We want this evening to be as interactive as possible. So, um, but before we get started, we'd like to thank everyone who uh, donated for tonight's evening. All of the money that was collected for tonight's evening is going to support a needy bride. And it is a very special segula, a very special omen to get married, to support a needy bride. And uh, which is why the money that we collect for this evening go to support needy brides. Also, um, if you haven't made uh, a profile yet, you can do so. You can use either jmatchmaking.com if you're an international, or you can use jmontreal.com. And if you use code Rabbi's Gift, it's completely free. There's already 30,000 singles in the database, and we're happy to be able to help you and to make this um, a special experience and to help you uh, tonight. Also, we want to make this evening a little more interesting and a little more interactive. And in our other evenings, we've had a tremendous success. Um, so someone asked me to put the links in the chat. Sure, jmontreal.com. The promo code is Rabbi's Gift. And there's also jmatchmaking, uh, jmatchmaking.com for, uh, for international. Now, because it happens to be that a good portion of us here tonight are single and looking, and so I like to honor those who are single and looking, and I'd also like to honor those who are either single or not single or not looking. So if you go and click on your profile, on your profile name, in front of your name, I want you to add either an A, which means available, or an NA, which means not available. Obviously, if someone puts an NA in front of their name, please respect them. They're not available. It could be they're married. It could be there's other reason why they're here. Maybe they're here to get advice for someone else or they're a matchmaker. Uh, so please um, change your, the name on the screen. Also, because we have people of all different ages and all different Jewish denominations, I'd like you, if you can, 
to write um, on by your name, you can write, I guess, the age range you're looking for. And you can write your religious affiliation. You can whatever, you know, you can write just Jewish or you can write Orthodox or modern Orthodox or, uh, you know, or Chabad or so that way people can see very good. If you looked at some people I can see, you know, right over here, A, Naomi, 32 to 42, modern Orthodox. It's exactly perfect. So that way people throughout the evening, aside for what's going on over here at the screen, you are welcome to create your own meetings. And obviously, traditionally, the men reach out to the women. So men, if a woman writes by her name A and she fits the category of a person that you're looking for, you, are, you can reach out to her. She's asking you to reach out to her. And don't be scared. Don't be shy. That's part of the joy and part of what these evenings are all about, for you to be able to find someone and obviously Tomorrow night is Purim, we're in Adar, we're in this time of absolute joy, and I know there's a special omen, a special merit for all of us to be able to, um, to meet our special someone, and for some of you, no pressure, tonight could be your night. You never know, it's Hashkacha Pratit, it's divine providence, and you never know when it is, so if we have this opportunity right now, I say, let's seize it. So that is my opening, um, my opening spiel. My name is Rabbi Yisrael Bernath. Many of you know me. Um, I've been talking about dating and relationships and matchmaking for about 15 years now. And I have all the stories I've shared vicariously with so many of you over the years. And so um, I'm very happy to be able to help many of you and um, these evenings are special evenings that allow us not only to come together, but also to be able to share and learn from one another. So the first half of tonight's program, which means until from now 814 until around nine o'clock, there's going to be a conversation. What I'm expecting of you is you can use the chat box. You can put your questions there. We'll try to get to all your questions in the chat box. You can also um, you can also, obviously, you're going to meet one another and you can contact one another. So that's all during our conversation. And then afterwards, from 9 to 9.45, there'll be an open Q&A where we will take priority for those of you who sent us questions by email before tonight's evening. And then, of course, you can send, you can send privately to me the questions or to Annie. Or you can ask it publicly. And at some point, we'll also allow you to unmute yourself to be able to ask questions that way so we can have an interactive conversation. So for now, let's get started. Welcome. I'd like to welcome dating coach, Annie Newman. Uh, Thank you, Rabbi Bernard. It's very nice to have you here this evening. It's an honor to be with you. Um, it's such a pleasure to join this discussion. Uh, you're the love rabbi. And when I think that you made over 50 matches, I'm like, wow, sometimes I try to do one match and then it's like, wow, so very, very, um, very big pleasure to be speaking with you. I, I always, I always say that if you, you know, you do one or two matches, then, then it, you can say you can guess it. But after you reach three, four, five, six, seven matches, it's not a guessing game. And that matchmaking is 90% skill and 10% talent. And a lot of matchmaking is really about the skill and the process of matchmaking. I don't know if that'll be, uh, you know, our discussion tonight, but I just thought I would, I, you know, it's important to mention that. So first of all, um, I love to find, like, when was the last time we spoke? How many years ago was it? So <laughs> we've been in touch recently, but before this, it was about 10 years ago when I was still dating. Um, and I came to your office very confused <laughs> and you told me the truth um that you know I came home and I was like oh but you really have a way in a few minutes to hear the person's story and to actually be able to give them real advice because a lot of people they try to go around you really were able I remember till this day what you told me <laughs> um that you're able to be very clear to the point and very helpful so so I'm just curious because Obviously, I've had a lot of conversations with a lot of singles, and you're not single anymore. 
So I want to kind of go back to that time and I want to work our way forward and kind of talk about that trajectory because I think from your story, there's a lot that can be learned um, for a lot of people who are having trouble. We call tonight Groundhog Date because a lot of people are doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. And so that was me. <laughs> so that's why I really think that your story has so much in it for people. And I don't, I, the truth is, and and you know, you, you called me earlier, you said, well, what are we going to talk about? And I said, I don't want to know. I want this to be raw. I want it to be open. I want it to be a real conversation. So we didn't plan this. We, we have no idea what it's going to be like and what we're going to talk about tonight. And I think that's such an important part of having conversations. We should not be planning these kinds of things because the magic and the joy is, is, uh, is, is the most important part of this. So so what happened 10 years ago? I don't remember that conversation. <laughs> Maybe it's good you don't remember it. <laughs> um, so basically I had come into your office and I had signed up to one of the Jewish uh, websites to meet people. And um, you probably don't remember, you told me you're not ready to get married. <laughs> and uh, the reason was because I had rejected 200 people on the website and the website closed me. They like literally kicked me out. Um, and the reason is that they were, a lot of them were American. I'm from Montreal originally. Now I live in New York. I just had to marry an American, <laughs> but um, I refused. Like whenever I would get a match and it said location, New York, Miami, LA, I would not even look at the picture. I would not even look who they are, what they do. It was like automatic no. And when I met you, you asked me a question. I, I'd be very surprised if you remember it, but you told me if you had two choices, meet someone who's in Montreal, but you don't like them super, super much, or someone in the US um, that you really like, what would you do? And I told you I would rather someone in Montreal that I don't like so much. <laughs> I don't want to move to the States. And you told me, OK, you're not ready to get married, get out of here. And uh, yeah, I was kicked off that website. <laughs> so so that, that's how it started. I, I don't remember this conversation. And <laughs> I, can't believe I think it's good. <laughs> I can't believe that we're actually talking right now after me saying that to you. But but just to follow that, so so you left you left my office and you had said something that you were pretty confident with. It sounds like that you would date someone or marry potentially marry someone that you didn't like as much because of location. That's because correct. Of where you lived. Yes, I was desperate not to leave Montreal. Like, you might wonder what's with Montreal that I like so much. Um, you know, when you grow up in a place, you have your family, you have your job. I had the same job for 12 years before I moved to New York. Um, I was teaching high school, um, amazing students, amazing school. And I had all my friends. And I was trying to picture myself, you know, a lot of my friends, especially girls, when they would get married to out of towners, they were the ones who had to move, not the guy. And I, I would tell people, you know, I think even one of your matchmakers had called me once. She's like, I have this guy in Toronto. He's amazing. I, I literally did not even let her speak. I'm like, not even Toronto, just you Montreal. Even to Toronto. Not even Toronto. Not even oh. Toronto. To me, it, I, until about a year before, I, two years before I met my husband, it was out of the question. Americans were out of the question. Um, but for some reason, I, I kept attracting Americans. <laughs> wow. This is so... See, I, I see this a lot with singles. And I think this is, I want to just focus on this point for a moment. I see this so often. Singles that are hung up on one thing or two things. And it really has nothing to do with a long lasting and happy relationship. Absolutely nothing. I mean, at the end of the day, if Hashem wants you to be in a particular place, Hashem is going to figure out a way to put you there. And we believe in the in the Jewish community, in the Orthodox community, we believe that the most important thing you should be doing in your adult life is getting married to the exclusion of everything else. What, what do you think of that? So I agree, but we do live in a time where people get married later in life and sometimes they'll put their career in front of um, the idea of getting married or they'll want to date a bit longer before getting married. Um, 
I can tell you that when I was single, even though I try my best to, you know, keep busy with fun activities and go out with friends, there was always that part that was missing. But I try looking at the big picture and like I have a lot to be thankful for, but I know that marriage will enhance my life. And now that I'm married, I can say that 100% marriage, regardless of religion, religious level, can I'm not saying that, you know, it's the, um, the answer to all the solutions to make someone perfectly happy, but it's definitely something that really enhances your life to have a lifetime partner, um, your best friend, you know, that you can build a life for. Um, not just someone you meet for a month or two and you have no clue, you know, how much do they care. Someone that for the rest of your life is committed to you. I think it's a very important Jewish value. So today you're married with a beautiful little baby. But you Thank God. How many years did you date for? Um, I'm scared to say this publicly, but I'm here to help people. That's why I became a dating coach. Um, I started dating when I was 22, officially, and I met my husband a month before I turned 35. <laughs> yeah, I, I dated a long time, a lot of people. <laughs> One of the reasons why I really thought of bringing you here is as a dating coach is because I find that I think you have a lot to share with people because your own experience is something that a lot of people go through. A lot of people go through this. So what would be your, 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 your best advice that you can give for someone who's been dating like you 13 years? What would you say to them? So it's going to sound a little simple, but from my experience, it's very true. Um, my answer to that question would be date someone who likes you. Because when we go out and we meet people, um, we're so like concerned about like different issues and how to impress them. And I always believe, of course, you have to impress the person you're dating. You have to dress nicely. You have to, you know, be on your best behavior. Um, but many, many relationships I've been in and my friends also tell me that after a month or two or after even, you know, if they're more orthodox, could be after five, six dates, the person starts losing a bit of interest and you try to keep it up. You try to keep impressing them and calling them and running after them. And when I met my husband, I was like, wow, this is mutual. Like I like him and he likes me. So when you go on your, your dating people, not just the focus, do I like them not, make sure you're with someone that it's mutual, that they also like you, that you don't always feel every day that you have to run after them and press them, that if you don't do something, you might lose them. So someone that you feel like it's mutual, you like them, they like you, you call them, they call you. And I remember one time I came to a dating coach, it was the only time I ever saw a dating coach in my life, it was one hour. I told her, come on, like, you know, what is going on here? What should I be doing differently? Like I, I text them and you know, what else should I be doing? She told me, yes, it's true. Like in Judaism often, like, you know, the man will be the one who, you know, proposes, who calls. And it's okay for the girl to text them, but you shouldn't be afraid. Meaning if you think that sending them a text is already a big problem, then the interest is probably not there. She said, it doesn't matter who texts each other first and things like that. As long as you both like each other, then who texted who just doesn't matter. Wow, that's so interesting. So do, do you like that advice that she gave you? I absolutely like it because one of the things that attracted me the most to my husband was that he was reliable, that when I would contact him and he would tell me we're meeting this day, we would meet. He didn't find excuses why he wasn't available because he actually wanted to meet. Um, and if he said he would call or text, he would call and he would text. And many, many people that I had dated in the past had shown me so much interest. They had flown, they took planes to see me from other countries. They, they called me on the video every day. And um, some of them spoke about very serious future. And then one day to the next, suddenly, um, you know, our uh, Sunday activities are going to be too different. We shouldn't move forward. Uh, the foods that we eat. And, and I would go and argue with them. You're sure I could change what I eat. I could change what I do. But I realized if someone likes you in the beginning, they don't have to like you forever. People change their mind. So being with someone that you like and likes you in return is unbelievably um, fulfilling. It's such a pleasure to be with someone that if you send them a text, you don't have to worry, oh, are they going to think something real that I texted them, you know, because you both like each other. 
So, so at the end of the day, here you are married. At the end of the day, what you're telling me is that all the things, what the foods, what we like, our interests, does not matter. It's just someone who likes you. That's it. So it matters. Obviously, you need to have shared interests. Like if my husband wanted to live in China, it would be a bit of a problem. Um, you have to have certain values in common. You do have to have, you know, certain things, obviously, that you, you see a future to build the rest of your life with a person. But it shouldn't be a person that one day they show you a lot of interest. And then a week from now, you know, they don't have time for you or they disappear for three days. You know, I've had people who didn't text me for three days and all my friends would say, it's normal, they're busy, they're stressed. No, if you really are in a serious relationship, someone who doesn't text you for three days, you should wonder how much they really like you. But, but maybe your value is finding someone who will spend quality time with you. Maybe that's just your value. Maybe for other people, um, it's something else. So as a person who, thank God, had a lot of friends before I got married, I had so much free time, I had tons of friends. Um, I can tell you that if all you want is someone to hang out with you, um, you know, you can join um, a yoga class, you can uh, go out with your friends for coffee. But if you want someone that, you know, you will share a house together, you'll have children together, God willing, um, you'll be, you know, spending time with each other's families for holidays. If you just want a friend, you know, you don't need to get married to find a friend. <laughs> I, I, I want to go back to the, the distance. You had a complete 180 about distance. You started off declining hundreds of potential dates because of distance. So I have a couple of questions about it. Number one is now that you have gone from, are you living in Montreal? Right now I live in Brooklyn. <laughs> you live in Brooklyn. Yes, I'm uh, live, live from New York. <laughs> <laughs> so do you think that distance is ever a deal breaker? Now that you've, you, I want to look at it from two different, before you answer it, I want to look at it from two different perspectives. I want to look at it from the perspective of the person who for 13 years was gung-ho about distance and now the person you are now. I want to see both sides. Okay, so... Obviously, if you would have asked me this before I met my husband, I would say for sure distance is a deal breaker. I'm not leaving my family, my friends, my job to be alone in some other city. Um, it really was a very serious deal breaker. Um, now that I'm married, I can tell you that um, it's still important, meaning that especially with COVID, there are moments where I'm like, man, I would love to be in Canada. Um, but when you have... Um, a lifetime partner that is your best friend and you build a family with, you, you realize, wait a second, I could always travel to go home. If they really like me and they really support me and they really understand me, why would they tell me that I can't go home? I mean, you're not a prisoner of that other city, right? Um, so you could take a plane and go visit or they can come and visit you. So it, it, I can't tell you that it's not important because you know we all have roots somewhere and it's hard to, to change cities. But I can tell you that uh, when you have a supportive spouse, they will be there when you need to go home. Actually, my husband's best friend um, is from New York and his wife is originally from Israel. And we were walking during the summer and he's like, yeah, my wife's in Israel for seven weeks. We're like, wow, you're a very supportive husband. And he wasn't jealous. He's like, you know, she's here the entire year. She spent all the Chagim here. She wants to spend the summer in Israel. It's a long trip. She has two kids. And he supported her. So it didn't create like a, a rift. Um, you know, if you have a very supportive spouse, you, you might miss your family, you know, if you're in a different city, but, uh, you know, you can always take a plane. They could always come see you. I'm just curious, how did you make that shift? Because it was such a strong value. It was a real, I'm going to call non-negotiable of yours. So how did you make that shift? So how I made this shift was I changed my thoughts. <laughs> Um, instead of saying no to every Canadian that was not a Montrealer um, and no to every American in the United States, <laughs> what I told myself is, you know what, what if I meet an American and I can convince them to move to Montreal? Um, and one of my uh, close uh, relatives, she married someone from Europe and the person now lives in Montreal. So 
I'm even in the process of convincing my husband to maybe, <laughs> maybe, uh, you know, someday move to Montreal. He's open to it. So I told myself, you know what? I actually heard of people who married someone from Israel or from New York or from LA. They live there two years and then they move to another country. So if you move to LA for a year, who knows, maybe your husband or wife will find a job in uh, Toronto next year. So, so it, it, it could change. It could change. I'm, I'm going to ask the obvious question that all of us are thinking right now. I'm just going to speak for everybody else. Couldn't he move to Montreal? Why did you have to move to New York? So um, when we got married two years ago, um, uh, he basically, you know, his, his job was very rooted here in New York. It's not a job that could be done outside of the U.S. It's a specific company that's very, um, it's really based here. And I told myself, you know what, um, I'm going to give it a try. And eventually, you know, when you go through the process of becoming a, you know, U.S. citizen and everything, eventually we'll consider maybe going to Montreal. So I just thought, given on the situation, that for our immediate future, I, I knew it's like, it doesn't mean it's forever, for our immediate future, I knew for both of us, it would be better if we started in the U.S. Do, do you feel, and, and again, if I ask you a question that you're not comfortable with, obviously just say I'm not comfortable answering that. Don't, you don't have oh, to. I'm very rarely uncomfortable with dating questions because before I got married, um, my friends would line up to go for coffee for me, with me to hear about my dating story. So it was actually one of my problems. I, I told my dating stories to everyone until I learned, you know what, let me stick to one or two people and, you know, not tell my whole life to everybody. <laughs> that's, a really, that's a really great piece of advice. I, I, it's something that I'm very strong about. When you're dating, that you should have only three people that know about your dating. Your matchmaker. Matchmaker is a very important person. You know, matchmaker's job is to push the match. Your mentor or your, you know, your counsel. It can be a parent. It could be a grandparent. It could be an older sibling. It could be a, a rabbi, a, a dating coach. It could be someone who's your mentor. But the, the rule is you have to listen to everything they say, whether you like it or not. And number three is a friend, one friend you get who you can, you, who you can line up for coffee and bounce off your ideas. Otherwise, it gets too confusing, right? If, if I may answer that point, I think it's one of the best points that you can possibly make in dating. Um, I have to say, when I was dating, I can think of two specific situations right now where I wasn't so sure. One, because the other person didn't show as much interest in me. And the other, because um, they really liked me and I didn't really like them. So it was like two, two opposites. And the person I didn't really like, I had broken it off after, before even meeting. We did some video calls. And <laughs> some of my friends and relatives were yelling at me, yelling at me that I'm picky, I'm mean, I'm superficial, I should give it a chance. So I actually, believe it or not, dated that person for six months. I recontacted them after I broke it off because of social pressure. And after six months, I broke up for the same reason that I broke up before I met them. And the other person that I really, really liked but had slowly started to lose interest, everyone was telling me, you know, um, they're busy, they're this, millions of advice of, as to why I should continue. And after many, many months, I broke it off for the same reason that I, I was seeking that advice. So yeah. I think, it's like you said, two, three people, because we all need to share, especially us women, <laughs> we love to share. Um, of course, you don't have to keep everything to yourself, but do trust your intuition. Like if you see something is wrong, okay, give it a few chances. But after a while, you know, trust yourself. You also should have confidence that your decision is right. You know, like you said, talk to matchmaker, friend, but don't tell all your coworkers, all your friends, everyone has different advice. And it gets confusing, right? It gets confusing when you get- Very when it becomes a survey, it's like, I don't know. I don't know who to listen to now. And so that's, that's right. good. And especially because you're so vulnerable and you're, you're, you're thinking about so many different things and your emotions and you're are flying and there's so much going on. You need people in your life that are going to center you, that are going to make you think instead of feel. You're feeling a lot. You need to start thinking. And I think that's the value of having someone like you, having a good dating coach, someone who can really advise you properly. I think it's such an important part. You know, Esther saying here in the comments, she says, I think you just know. Do you think you just know when you find the right person? No, not on the first day. <laughs> I just knew after three days. Um, I met a lot of people in my dating years um, and everyone told me, you have to give a second chance. You have to give a second chance. 
So from my personal experience, after meeting, maybe I shouldn't say how many people, but really an extreme lot, um, I would say that maybe three, four days is a reasonable amount of time to decide if there's potential, not if you're gonna marry them, just if there's potential. If I went on a first date and I told myself it's an absolute no, there's no way, usually 99.99 .99 when I said it's an absolute no, I would say 100% because you know it was not my husband. Um, I was right when I said no, but the people that you tell yourself, you know what, they're a little bit shorter than me, they're a little bit less religious, a little bit more religious, those people that there's hope, like 5%, I would say two, three, four days, then it's fair enough to, to say there's a potential. So, so do you think that when someone, when two people are dating, like let's say, let's say you're giving advice to, to one of your clients and um, they come back from a date and they're like, no, it was no good. What would you, what do you say to them? Do you say to them automatically, I think you should give it another try? Like what are the criteria for you to give advice to someone who didn't like their first date because that's very common so a lot of first date, a lot of people seeing each other a lot of people having that first experience so what what kind of advice do you give your clients so i have two advice for that number one it's very very important something that i didn't do for years it's very important to make a list of what you want and what you don't want but when i say what you don't want i don't mean like oh i don't want someone shorter than me I mean, someone that you would rather be single than date. So let's say you meet someone and they're amazing in every way, but you saw that they were rude to the waiter. Me, someone who's rude to the waiter, I don't care if they're a multimillionaire, if they're this, if that, they're good looking, I do want someone who's rude. So you have to know what you want. So let's say you went on a first date and you didn't like the guy because he was a little bit shorter than you. So tell yourself, can I live with this? So if you give two, three chances, like I said earlier, you'll be able to know if it's something you can get over or if the person's wearing glasses and it bothers you. Um, after two, three dates, you might forget even that they're wearing glasses. So it has to be, is it something that, wow, you went on the first date and the person said something or did something that was just like, un, like no, or is there any hope? I would say even five, 10% hope, that little, I would give another chance, but zero would mean there's no way, zero. Do you find that a lot of people date and they're after a first date, they're jumping to like, can I marry this person in their head? That's me also. <laughs> um, so I'm going to tell you something that I learned from my experience. It's that when we like something or, or we like someone, love is blind. You know the famous expression, love is blind? I, I don't know who invented that expression, but they're so right. Um, when you date someone that you find attractive for whatever reason, you think they're attractive physically or financially, they have an unbelievable, cool, amazing job, or they're so funny, like you, or, you know, they're a famous doctor or something like that. You, you're so into them that anything that they do is perfectly fine. You find excuses for it because you say, you know what, they're so amazing. You, you really don't realize the faults that are in front of you or the mistreatments that are in front of you because you you like them so much and i don't know if it happened to you obviously as a matchmaker and some of our viewers that your friend tells you about something that their date did to them and you're like wow how could they accept this and they don't realize someone's doing something much worse to them but they like them so much and they're afraid to be single again they're afraid that they'll never meet someone who's as cool as good looking as wealthy and so I would say, if you could set aside two fears, you'll be very successful in dating. The first fear is being single because you're not single forever. It's just temporary if you want to get married. So it's okay to be single for a while to meet, to leave something bad, to meet something better. And two, if you're okay with the fear of not meeting someone you like as much as the person you're dating now, even if you think you'll never meet another pilot, another astronaut, if you could set that fear uh, aside, you'll be able to meet the right person. So on that fear, setting that fear aside, it's become this common issue in our society today that dating became a game. What, what do you say to your clients about the dating game? So if you're referring to game as in, you know, 
um, the person has to wait three days after the first date. Um, is that's what you're referring to? Game. Like they're not themselves. They're, well, how, when do I contact them? How do I do this? You know, even when they're first meeting, I don't know what kind of conversations are going on now while we're talking, but I'm assuming there's a few conversations going on. Like, how do I say it? What do I say? Do I have to be funny? Do I have to be interesting? Like it became this whole game where people are not being themselves. Right. So I have a lot of experience in that. And I can tell you there's something that is, you know, unwritten rules of dating that are just traditions in life. You know, you go on a first date, usually the man will probably open the door, you know, um, text you, be the first one to text you. I think the first two or three dates, it's okay to follow tradition. Let him call you after the first date, you know, as a girl, you want to know if he likes you, you want to know what's happening, you want him to step up, it's okay. So he, has to make um, the, he has to make the first few moves. Exactly, like the, the tradition. But after that, if you feel the need to play games with a person, meaning if I text them, well, they think I'm too interested, I'm too pushy, um, I'm gonna specifically wait six hours to answer their text, so they think I'm so busy and have such a cool life. Those games, you might as well throw them out the window because if the person likes you back, like my first thing I told you when we started, be someone who likes you. Um, I realized when someone likes you, everything that you were scared to do with other people, they're not gonna care. Because they like you. They don't care if you texted them. They're happy, you know? So but what about that initial, the, the beginning? So you're saying the guy has to make the first few moves. But but how do we, is there is there a process to that? Would you, If your client came to you, would you say, this is how you do it? Like, what's that, what is that like to ungamify it? So I have to tell you, if I didn't live this myself, I would say, what she's saying maybe is wrong. But from my own experience, just because it's human nature, if a girl goes on a date with a guy and he never texts her after the first date, you could break the game and text them. But 99% of the time, chances are the person didn't really want to meet again because they think it's not a match. Um, so the idea of playing games, you know, I'll wait three days to text the guy so I, I don't show him too eager. If, if you're even thinking about, the, you know, waiting three days, it's already lost because a, a, a guy who goes on a first date and never calls you back, he didn't call you back because you didn't text him. I actually texted guys after the first date who didn't text me because I like them so much. I'm like, finally, someone I like who's in Montreal, you know, um, and they never texted me back. And I knew they were not good for me. One was six years younger. One was this, like, and I still texted them and they would answer me, listen, I had a good time, but it's not a match. And I was like, yeah, I didn't probably figure it out. I'm like, I'm nothing to lose. But playing games and calculating, when someone likes you, you don't need to wonder if they like you. You will know that they like you. Why? Because they call you, they text you, and they don't disappear forever. <laughs> wow. Well, what do you say about ghosting? That's become very popular now. Okay. That's an excellent, excellent question because that's not just about other people, but how you're gonna feel about yourself. Um, unfortunately, until a few years before I met my husband, I was a ghoster and now I have a dating blog. And I have a whole article really? about don't, don't ghost people, it's not nice. Um, I'm gonna tell you, when someone calls you that you don't like them back, whether it's after one date or a uh, hundred dates, it's so much better for you and for them to say, you know what, we tried it out. I don't think it's a match. I wish you the best. That's it. If you start ignoring them, inventing excuses, you're going to drive yourself crazy and them crazy. I, I had a guy one time call me maybe six days in a row because I wouldn't answer him. And he actually told me, if you just told me you're not interested, I, I would be at peace, you know. Um, and then I felt horrible about myself. And then what changed? Someone did it to me. <laughs> Someone ghosted me, disappeared off the face of the earth after a few months. Uh, not a goodbye. Just slowly decreased the text until they just didn't reply. And I was so profoundly hurt that I said, I will never do this to someone again. Even if I never met them, if I get a match on a website, on the, I don't care if there was zero interaction. I will never ghost another person. I will, for the sake of, of uh, good positive vibes for everyone. Hi, it was really nice. Or I saw the profile. It's not a match. I wish you the best. That's it. 
just to have that communication, just to be able to yeah. have that closure. Yeah, I mean, if it was six months, you know, the person has the right to ask you a little bit more. Um, you, you can say very politely, we tried it. I really appreciate this and this about you, but you know, I would like to move forward with uh, other plans or something else I'm looking for. I, I will think of you and I wish you the best, but ghosting, it's, it's very, very, very hurtful. I, I, I used to think, you know, if I tell him the truth that I didn't like him, he's gonna be so offended. Like if I don't answer him, he'll think maybe I'm busy or something, but it's not true. Like when it was happening like to me, I realized I'm never doing that again, you know? We're, we're getting a lot of questions coming in about, um, about long distance relationships. I wanna go back to that for a second. Do you think that distance is ever a deal breaker? Now that you know what you know. Okay, so that's a very difficult question. <laughs> it's a very difficult question because it depends where the person lives. I have to say that, like I said earlier, if you're going to marry someone who lives in Australia or China, I'm trying to give the further example I could, but they are willing, they, they sit you down and they say, listen, if we get married, I support you. We could go to your hometown for the holidays. You know, they can come to our house. If they're going to be very supportive, it should not be a deal breaker. No. If it's a person that, you know, tells you, okay, we're moving to uh, New Zealand tomorrow and uh, we're going to see your family once every five years. I mean, it's a hard question. It's a hard question. Um, but I can say, you know, my sister-in-law told me that if my brother told her she's going to China for five years, she'd have no problem with it. So, um, it's, it's a very, told, if your husband told you right now that we're moving to China for five years, because I got a good job, would you go? I, I can't say it wouldn't be hard, but yes, I would go because I, this, this person is someone, you know, that I, that I respect. I want to spend the rest of my life with, and I would make I'm sure that my family would come to China and I'm sure that my husband would do everything he could to get my family to come visit me in China though it's not my dream to, to live there but um knowing the person that he is he would make sure that if I can't come my family would come yeah but isn't it amazing to just I'm just just anecdotally isn't it amazing how so many hang-ups that we have when we're dating just kind of fall away when we're married? Absolutely. My husband is actually shorter than me. <laughs> you can't see me on the video. I'm 5'8", he's 5'6". Um, <laughs> he's not watching right now, but the first time I met him, I was like, man, he's shorter. And when I, I didn't know, like he was like shorter, but a lot of profiles I would get from like Shidukhim website or, or dating website, it didn't matter who they were. If it said 5'6 on it, it was out of the window. There was no chance I was dating a guy who was shorter than me. Like no chance. I didn't care who he was. Even if he was in Montreal, I actually had a matchmaker beg me. Actually, this story is amazing. She begged me to meet someone and I told her he's too short. And I ended up meeting him and I was like, wow, in person, he's, he doesn't look as short as the pictures. And then, you know, I, I got over this a little bit, but, um, so, so what do you say to your clients? How do you get over it? Because there's so many hangups. So many singles are, I mean, everybody here that's listening can give you a list of things that are non-negotiable for them. And, and it's amazing to me that you had these non-negotiables and they're gone now. So how do we, now that we're all, you know, we're in a different space, we're not in the single space. How do married people convey to singles that, your hangups are not hangups. So my thoughts about this um, would be to write a list, but not like a shopping list of what you're looking for and what you're not. And like I said earlier, the hangups you're talking about, they're not hangups. They, people don't realize that if someone is shorter than you're wearing glasses, if you actually sit and write down, you will know in your heart that someone who's wearing glasses is not a hangup for you. It's a turnoff maybe, or something that bothers you, it's not, it's not a non-negotiable. If you write down what is unacceptable, you tell yourself, okay, I'll meet a, a guy or a girl, they're wearing glasses, it bothers me, but it's it's a it's a hang up. It's not unacceptable to me. If you know what's unacceptable, you'd rather be single, 
then you're going to have a lot more clarity what you're looking for. You know, I, I've asked this question to others, but I feel like asking this question to you is more important because of your experience, both personally and professionally. What do you think are the most important things? What would you say to your client? What do you say to your clients? What are the most important things you really should be looking for? Aside, okay, so. aside for all these, what, what are you really supposed to be looking for? And I know you said before, I asked this differently before, and, and, and I know you said, oh, you know, that he has to like you. But, but, but when you wanna make that list, when you're thinking of that list, what are you really supposed to be putting in that list? So I think that's a great, great question. And the reason why I think it's a great question is because at the end, we're all human and we all want the same basic things. We all want to feel attracted to our spouse. We all want, um, you know, to be with someone who we consider smart, successful. I mean, these things, it's like, don't even bother putting them on the list. Everybody wants that, you know? I think what is the most important is aside obviously that the person, you know, um, like I said earlier, it's, it's mutual, it's fully mutual. It's that the way that they treat you. I dated people that if you saw their profile, you would be like, wow, maybe there's like a hundred people waiting to date this person. Their profile was like, wow. But the way that they were treating me, they did me a favor by ending it because I liked them so much, I didn't want to end it. And then I tell myself, wow, if I would have stayed with these people, okay, so I would benefit from all the things I was attracted to, but they were treating me so badly. So number one, aside from mutual liking is the way that they treat you. So a lot of my friends and, and myself as well, we met people who had all the things that we wanted, most of the things, but the way that they treated us, they were not reliable, they were not nice. Um, Sometimes they would be there, sometimes they would ignore, they, they would give mixed feelings, uh, sorry, mixed um, messages. So I think the way that the person treats you, it's a lot easier to be endeared to someone when they treat you well. I think that's also very, very important. Wow. So you're saying, it's interesting because you're saying, and, and, I, and I'm letting it land. One of the reasons why I'm, I'm waiting here is I'm, I'm listening to what you're saying. And I wanna really, listen to you and, and not to be thinking about my next question. And that's so important in general, when you're having a conversation, you know, well, the, one of the greatest things that we can do is, is, is be examples for, for, for relationships. And when you're having a conversation, not to, so often we're thinking, what's the next thing I'm gonna say? But you wanna listen to the person, mm -hmm. not let it land, listen to mm -hmm. them, allow that to happen. I'm not saying that to you, I'm just saying that you know, for you and me and, and, and for everybody. Mm -hmm. So, and I see this so often that you said something so interesting in, in, in that little, that last little piece. You said that even though you knew they were wrong for you, you still continue dating them. And I find that so often we're attracted to one kind of person, but in our head, we know we want a different kind of person. And there's this dissonance between the heart and the mind, how do we make that change? How do we be attracted to the same person we know is good for us? So it does go back a little bit to what I said earlier, that there are two main fears that are blocking us from matching what we want and what we should be with that we know in our hearts. And there, it's really those two big fears, one, if I break up with this wonderful person that I think is wonderful, maybe they're not, I'm going to be single. What is, what are my friends going to say? What are my family going to think? You know, I'm a certain age, what I'm going to restart all over right now. So the fear of being single is blocking from, you know, getting what you want versus what you, you need. And um, the other one is really fearing not meeting someone as amazing as this person. I, I met people that I told myself, wow, how am I ever going to meet someone who's X, Y, and Z? Um, and that fear was blocking me from moving on. So if you can release those two fears, I know it's so hard. <laughs> it's really, really hard. Um, it's going to really help you look what you actually want and need. So I, I hear two different things from people. I hear people say, 
that there's someone else better out there for me. And people say, there's no one out there for me. What do you say to that? So um, I believed both these things before I got married. <laughs> Um, uh, my, when my brother was dating, he's married now, um, uh, he was dating a girl and I called him, I'm like, you know, if it doesn't work with her, I know someone else for you. <laughs> he's like, don't do this to me. Never do this to me. He's like, you're going to put in my mind. Maybe the other one is better. Don't even tell me her name. I never said the name. He ended up marrying that girl. <laughs> so yes, I was that one also thinking, uh, maybe there's someone who's X, Y, and Z better. Um, and wow, the thing that actually helped me meet my husband is the second thing that you said. You said there's no one other for me. I met my husband a month before I turned 35 and I was networking like crazy and you know doing a lot of things. And I told myself, wow, like does he exist? Maybe he doesn't exist. <laughs> I don't know, where is he? What planet is he on? And I, I comforted myself. I said, you know what? I only need one person that I like. I, I, if I go on a shiduchim or, or dating website, or if I go to an event, if they all sound horrible, 99% of the matches I get, it's normal. I'm looking for one person that I like, just one. It's okay if every day you go on is horrible. It's okay if every match you get is horrible because you don't marry hundred people. And I told myself it only takes one. And um, very, very quickly after I met my husband, because I stopped being discouraging, discouraged of all the matches I was getting. Maybe they're not so horrible. <laughs> um, in our minds, we think they're horrible, even if they're not. <laughs> okay, but maybe we're just have the strong defense mechanism and, and they're really not that bad. It's just us. Um, so, you know, everyone is, is um, everyone has what they're looking for. You know, I'm sure it happened to you. I'm sure it happened to everyone listening that you go to a wedding and there's a couple sitting at your table and you're like, wow, like she's a top model. He's like, you know, wow. But for her, he's like better than, you know, 10 people you want to present to her. She's very happy, she, you know? Um, and, it's really, we all have what we're looking for and we all have what we want. We all have, like I said, the basic things that we want, but then you have your personal things, you know, um, you're very attracted to someone who's into art or who's a thinker, you know. Um, I always knew I needed someone who, who was a bit of a thinker, you know, who, uh, who liked to talk about deeper things, you know. So we all have, you know, what speaks to us. Doesn't mean it's a deal breaker, but it's what speaks to us personally. So interesting. It's so interesting. We, we, we could talk for, uh, for, you know, for a while, but um, this is uh, the, the end of our official conversation, but we have so many questions that have come in before tonight, and we have questions that are coming in now. So for those of you who have put your questions in the chat, I'm going to go through those questions now, and you're welcome to continue writing your questions. We'll go through the questions in the chat first, and then at some point, uh, we'll allow you also to unmute yourself if you'd like. So um, I'm going to go through a number of questions and uh, let's see what you have to say about some of these. Um, how would you make a long distance relationship work when COVID isn't helping with meeting each other, traveling to see each other? Um, so I have to say that I do have to give it, I have to give a lot of credit to everyone right now who is um, looking for a match. Um, I can only imagine how hard it is to try to meet people during COVID. And um, I have to say, you know, my dating coach, because I, I became certified, I decided I wanted to help people. I asked her the same question. I'm like, what are people supposed to do? It's, it's really a difficult situation. She told me something that stayed in my mind. She said, change the script. Today, a lot of things are online. Find ways to meet people online. You know, uh, find online events. Um, uh, you know, both order Uber Eats and have a, a date where you're both, you know, having a drink uh, and, and eating something on the video. She said, make the most out of it. We're looking for connections. And if right now, temporarily, everything is online, then no one will think you're weird if you want to have an online date or meet people online. It's not weird anymore. 
I, I like that answer a lot. And, and one of the things that I'm thinking about as you're saying that is, okay, um, this is the world that we live in. We're going to be dating online. So here we are online. You and I are online right now, right? Let's just pretend. Let's just uh, role play it just for the heck of it. H how, do, how do we transcend the screen in order to actually bring the vibrancy of our personalities? Because it just becomes, you know, you're sitting there and I'm sitting here and it just becomes the this, right? And it's very weird. Right awkward and there's no way to unawkwardize a first date like what do you, what kind of advice do, do you give your clients for for transcending the screen so i think it's a very good question um i think that you know the first i have to just say by the way that because i had a lot of long distance relationships before i got married i finally accepted to date americans I probably did more online data, dating before COVID than some people are doing now. Like I had months long of online dating before. Um, and I have to tell you something that as important as it is to do those video calls, at some point you're gonna have to meet. If it means that you're in a separate car because of COVID, if it means that um, you have to travel to another city and, and you know, meet in two separate bench, uh, park benches that are you know, six feet apart. I have to tell you, I dated some people for many months through, you know, online because they were, you know, on the other side of the country in, in the California. And there were things I discovered three days after six months of talking online, after three days of meeting in person, Things I would have never ever known. I could have talked. I could have talked two years on the video. It would not have helped. But, so I think you have to do the video because they're important to build. You know what you have in common. You talk. You can eat together. But at some point, even if it's in three months, you must must meet because they might tell you a comment about what you're wearing. You're like shocked. You know you you were having such a good conversation, and suddenly they, they tell they make you an unpleasant comment or. Or, uh, you know, like I said, they could be rude to someone in front of you. They could be rude to their mother. And you, you never knew they were rude to their mother. Like, how would you know doing a video call they're rude to their mother, you know? That's so interesting. So what you're saying is because for a lot of people, it's not a reality right now. We, they just can't do it for whatever reason, health reasons or, you know, fear or it's just not a reality right now. So you're saying that no matter what video dating, no matter how great the video date is, it doesn't matter. You have to meet the other person. Unfortunately, yes. Um, I understand it's very hard to meet in people uh, in person. And I would say if after many video calls, you see there's something wrong, move on to somebody else because you might be wasting a lot of time if you if you really feel it. But if you think the person has potential, even if you don't know if you want to marry them, obviously, you must must meet even if it's three days, even if it's like, you know, three days where you meet two hours every day. I cannot tell you, it happened to me more than once that in person I discovered things I would have never in a million years discovered doing a video call, never. Wow, I, I, I wanna circle back to this though. How do you transcend the screen right now? Let's say we were on a date right now. What would you do right now on the date to be able to be more than just a talking head? Because right now we're just talking heads. So I'll tell you an advice that my brother told me. <laughs> Um, like you said, you know, you're going to talk about your day, you're going to talk about your brother and your aunt and your worker, your coworkers. I asked my brother, you know, my brother's very orthodox and he only went on 10 dates with his wife. And I asked him like, you went on 10 dates. How are you supposed to know that she was the right one? Or you just sat there and, you know, spoke about your, your, you know, coworkers. He said, no, we tried to talk about things that were a little bit controversial. So we would think of things, you know, what do you think about relocation? What do you think um, if I decide I want to do this religious uh, step? What, what, how would you react if, you know, I, um, I would switch jobs? Like, you, you don't start, you know, saying things that you're going to break up over the conversation, but you try to bring juicy topics. Like, you think in advance, okay, you know what, tonight, instead of just talking about my day, I'm going to ask him, like, what would you do if I asked you, you know, I got a job in Toronto, like, how would you react? Obviously not on the first day, but you, you kind of get into a little bit of juicier, con controversial conversations. Do you have a list of these kind of questions that you go over with your clients? Like, do you, do you come up with these kind of questions with your clients? That's something you do? Um, 
it's it's not like um it's not like a major question that I've received, but I have to say that some of these questions would probably go along the line. What if I change religiously? If I become more religious, less religious, how would you react? Um, what if, you know, it's, it's the holidays and you live in Boston, I live in Montreal and my parents want Rosh Hashanah to be in Montreal. How would you act like? It would be things that you're gonna poke them, but not to the point that you're gonna, you know, want to have like a fight with them. Okay. That's really good. That's really, really good. Okay, I'm going to go back. So a lot of questions are coming in. We, I don't know if we'll be able to cover them all, but we're going to... Uh, um, um, I, so let's go into a few more. Here, here's an interesting one. Somebody writes here, I'm so fed up. I just gave up. What do you say to someone who's given up? So I basically almost gave up. <laughs> not physically, but a little bit mentally before I met my husband, I was, I had dated a lot and I was almost, you know, starting to wonder if there's a person for me. I, I almost kind of give up. I actually, for a few months, deleted all matchmaking websites, whether they were orthodox or modern, I deleted them. I said, you know what, it's too discouraging. I need a break. Um, and I would go back to the thing I said earlier, you know why you shouldn't be fed up? Because you're only looking for one. You have every right to feel fed up that everyone you're meeting is not working out. Encourage yourself by telling yourself, if I go on an online matchmaking or if I go and ask people to set me up, tell yourself, it only takes one. I'm only looking for one. That's what I told myself to encourage myself. Wow. It only takes one. It only takes one. But yeah, and somebody said before in the chat, I thought it was really great. You know, there's, it only takes one. It may take you 99 to get to that one, but that's amazing. That's very correct. <laughs> yeah. Here, somebody else writes here, sometimes people say they're not engaged because they're too picky, too scared. But as soon as they get engaged, we say, that's when Hashem wanted them to find their partner. So is it our issues? Or is this when Hashem wanted you to get married? So I have a perfect answer for you. Um, I had dated someone who was 39 going on 40. This was a few years ago. Uh, they were a bit, you know, older than me. And they just were notorious. And I was one, this person is, uh, what's that word that they use? Um, they don't commit, like commitment phone. They don't commit. And that person was very serious, talking about the future, whatever. They broke up with me. And I'm like, you know what? They were right. He's such a commitment phone, you know? A month, I would say maybe three months later, that person was engaged and got married. So wow. it goes back to, it's just not the right person. So I don't believe in commitment phobia. If you're dating someone that says, you know, they're picky, they're commit, it's not true. They like the other person, but not enough that they want to spend the rest of their life with. There's something blocking them. Wow. Here's an interesting one. It's more of a statement, but I want to hear what you say to this. A lot of guys are saying they can't move for a job or family. I grew up traditionally, this, this person says, if a guy wants a woman who will move mountains for her, what do you say to that? So you mean that uh, he's expecting the girl to move? No, but wh whatever it is, what she's saying is that if a guy wants a woman, he'll do whatever is necessary to get her. Is that right? Is that true in today's day and age? So I have to say it's all about how the person says it. Even if they feel like, wow, when I date a girl, of course, if I marry her, she should follow me. It's okay if he thinks it, but there's a way to say it. You shouldn't necessarily say it like that. Um, very, very briefly, I was once in Israel in uh, Jerusalem and I was having breakfast and there was a girl right behind me. I heard her entire conversation and she was telling her, her friend, I told the guy that I'm willing to move and he said, he's not willing to move. How can I marry him? It's so unfair that he's told me this. And I thought to myself, and this was way before I got married. I'm like, she has the right to be frustrated. Not because he doesn't want to move because of the way he told her. If in your heart, you don't want to move, but you want to marry this person, tell him, listen, right now, I'm not ready to move, but I really like you. I really support you. And I really hope that in a year, in five years, in eight years, I'll have the resources to be able to move and give it a chance. But if the person's like, no, I'm not doing this for you. It's not that they don't want to move. It's the way that they're talking to you. You want to marry me, but you're, you're not willing to compromise. Like you don't have to compromise, but at least be willing to compromise. That is, that is fantastic advice. 
we, we so often think in black and white, yes or no. It's not yes or no. It's just not right now. Maybe in the future. Who knows what the future will bring? Who knows what will happen? That, that's amazing. That, that I did not expect that kind of a, that answer. That, that, that's right. right. It's just not right now. It could, that's right. I, it, it's the same thing for religion. Tell me. Tell me more. Um, so <laughs> I'm, I became more religious when I was a teenager. And then when I got a little bit older, I got even more orthodox. And, um, you know, when I would meet people, it was always a question, like, are they willing to be more religious, you know, for me and things like that? And some people told me, no, I don't want to ever be more religious than I am. And I would tell them, listen, you know, you have every right to your religious beliefs. Don't become religious. But the way that you're telling me this, clearly you're not that interested in me because I know couples myself, I know personally, where the woman was not religious at all, but she liked the person and slowly but surely she did it at the beginning for, for that person. And then, you know, because she wanted to. And I, I would never tell someone become religious or less religious or something. Never, never tell them that. But it's the way they tell you, listen, I really like you, but I don't really see myself becoming that religious. But I, I, is there a way that we can make it work? You know, what could we, you know, do to make it work? It's, it's like they're putting a barrier, an unneeded barrier between you and them for no reason. Yeah, if they tell you, I never want to be this or that, they're kind of telling you how they're going to be for other things. <laughs> Yeah. Here's a really good one. I get this question a lot. I'm sure you do as well. I'd love to hear your answer on this one. How do you avoid the friend zone? So <laughs> I've been in the friend zone, <laughs> very guilty. And um, it's not a fun place to be. And the way to avoid being in the friend zone is to remove yourself from the friend zone because that friend will probably not remove you because you're in the friend zone because they're too scared to tell you that they're not interested. Um, so I was that girl who uh, was like, you know, texting, trying to find ways to be interesting and, you know, this and that until one day the person told me, you know, we're just friends. I'm like, what? Oh, oh, yeah, I kind of should have figured it out. So if you are in the friend zone, I have to tell you, don't try to get out of it. You know, don't try to convince them to move on. You have to remove yourself from the friend zone. Wow. Here's an interesting question. And, 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 and you know, I've, I love these questions the most because someone's challenging me here. In the beginning of tonight's talk, I said that there's all these singles here and that, that, that traditionally the man pursues the woman. And I do believe that. And here this person is saying, women can and should be able to make the first move. Who wrote these rules? Do you think that right now we should say to all the women, why don't you make the first move? I love that question because when I was dating, I am the person who used Google search the most for that answer. <laughs> Because I would go out with people and I'm like, okay, he didn't call me after the first date or the third. You know, we live in modern times. I know girls who chased after guys and they got married and they're happy, you know? Um, so I told myself, well, why can't I do that? I even know a girl who the guy had no interest and she did a lot of things to impress him and, you know, they ended up getting married and they're happy. So I believe that in life there's rules and there's exceptions to rules. And even though you could be the exception, if you want to propose, if you, you know, to a guy or you want to be the first one asking him that, no one's going to judge you. It's perfectly fine. It's not a sin, you know, to call someone, but just know that there is such a thing as human nature. And it's just the fact that if you go out after the first day, the first date and the guy never calls you back, Chances are you could call him a hundred times. Maybe he'll date three months and then he'll, he'll break it off for the same reason he didn't call you the first time. So I even had a guy who texted me after the first date. At night I came home and he texted me, I'm breaking all the rules and I'm texting you the same night. I had such a good time. Can't wait to see you again. And then he never, never called me back, never texted me ever again. So, you know, of course wow. you could break the rules. Of course you could break them, but know that there's a reason why in life there's unwritten rules. Okay, the dating coach says you can break the rules. 
Women who I said before, the man should pursue you. There's exceptions. You're all exceptions right now. Break the rules. <laughs> I'm okay, I'm wrong. I was wrong. Look at that. I'm allowed to be wrong too, I'm human. My grandparents, this person says, my grandparents put some pressure on me about dating before they passed away. Is that common? It's more than common, especially if you're Jewish. <laughs> if you have grandparents who have not put pressure on you to be married, they're just not typical grandparents. You should like really party if they're not putting pressure on you. Um, um, I, I, it goes back to what I said earlier that when, especially as, as a Jewish person, especially if you're traditional and wow, if you're Orthodox, we don't even talk about it there is so much pressure to get married from parents, grandparents, cousins, coworkers. <clears throat> and I have to tell you, I stayed strong. It was really hard all these years. I told myself if I wanted to be married, just to be married, I could have done it many times, but I knew that I wanted what I wanted and it was very hard to be patient, but it was worth the wait. So again, you're allowed to be a little bit picky, but give a chance to the person if they're 100 percent not your type move on but if there's like a four percent chance you might like them give them another chance i i, I so agree with that do, do you think this whole thing with the pressure from the parents and the grandparents and the pressure to get married is not helping because then you whenever you meet someone it's like oh my gosh this could be the one. Oh my gosh look at that they have a nose and their mom is jewish boom i would have to say if you're of the Jewish faith, maybe the Italian faith or Greek <laughs> uh, or Middle Eastern for that matter, a lot of faiths, not maybe typical American or Canadian, but in a lot of faiths uh, and religions, um, because we value the idea of marriage very, very deeply and, you know, moving on and having families, there will be that pressure. Wow. Um, in some cultures, it's kind of acceptable to, you know, you just live with someone, you have kids with them, and no one thinks it's weird. They actually think it's weird if you're married, you know. Um, but if you are the Jewish faith, or like I said, of a Mediterranean or Middle Eastern faith, you probably are going to have a mountain of pressure. And you might not want to break up with someone because you can't go and tell your mom or your grandma or your cousin, we broke up. It's just so hard to start dating again. Amazing. So I think this gets into this other question. Do you think it's difficult to marry Jewish now compared to any other time in history? So I've, I've had this discussion with people before. Um, so they were both hard in different ways. In history, if you were, you know, living in a shtetl or in a ghetto, it was kind of easy to get married because you, everyone went to matchmaker and everyone knew who you were. You didn't have to go to parties and online and tell people you're single like everyone knew each other every knew, everyone knew who was single and you were probably going to be set up you were not going to meet someone in an event so in that sense it was easier but it was harder because you didn't have much of a choice who you're going to marry you know like my grandmother's sister i think she she was kind of pushed into marriage with someone much older and the, the you know it, it was like not like the best quality. So today it's physically harder to meet people because people are not sending you up. They don't know who you are. They don't know you exist. You're not in a ghetto. Um, but you're more likely to meet someone on your own or that you really like um, than just like some arranged thing because you know everyone knows you have to get married at a certain age. Wow, it's very interesting. This person asks here, what do you think is the reason people bring up with texting today? Is it become more common? What do you think about texting in general with relationships? So there's so much to talk about, about texting. I'm, I'm sure we don't have tons of time. Um, there's many, many aspects of texting. Um, the first aspect in dating, I've said this to one of my friends recently. Um, when you text someone, they don't know the emotion you have. They don't know the tone of voice. I recently texted someone for nothing to do with dating. And I realized after I sent it that it sounded so bad. It sounded almost like mean when it was like the total opposite of what I wanted to tell them, you know? Um, so if you're dating someone and you know, when you're dating, you're so sensitive, every comment someone makes you like, do they like me? It's, it's texting is like, okay, we're meeting tomorrow night or 
let me know how was your day i wish you a happy birthday you know but if you want a real conversation you can't have it through texting um and i have to say that um, i actually wrote an article about this that if someone is mostly texting you in the relationship it's probably because they don't have as much of an interest in you really well well here, here's another question that came in um i don't know if more of a comment but i'd love to hear your 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 take on this if you own one coffee cup and you want a really good cup of fresh coffee you have to throw up the old coffee in the cup wash it before you can get a really great cup of coffee that you know exists some people just put the old coffee in the microwave to reheat it that's like going out with the same type of person over and over again hold out be alone for a while, start fresh. What do you think about that? I think that it's absolutely true that, and I'm guilty of that as well, that we keep dating the same type of people because we think that's what we're looking for. So if I could give myself as an example, even though I'm Orthodox, as you can see, I'm pretty religious. Um, I grew up you know, in a more like modern type of environment. And whenever someone wanted to set me up with another person who was like much more like, like for example, my husband is Chabad and my family is not Chabad. Um, I mean, I didn't grow up Chabad. I didn't want someone who was like, to me, I was like, oh, they're so religious, you know, even though I was keeping Shabbat and kosher and everything. So I kept dating people who were more on the modern side, but I realized that I was pretty religious and I wasn't working out. So I made the decision to only date Orthodox people. And I met two, three people, and then I met my husband. When I stopped, I, I wanted to give chances. I give tons of chances to people who are less religious than me. I, and it was the same people all the time. Yeah, yeah, you know, we'll go to a kosher restaurant for the first date. And then the second day, they'll, they'll take you to a non-kosher place. So like, you know, you're sitting there, you can't even have anything, you know. Um, so I made a decision. I'm like, you know what, even though I'm open to people who... Um, you know, they can do whatever they want. I know that at the end of the day, it's going to be really hard for me to keep Shabbat if the person is not home, they're working, or they have the right to do whatever they want. But for me, it's going to be hard. So wow. after many years, I said, you know, I'm only going to date people who share my religious values just because it's hard. And like I said, I met two, three people, and then I met my husband. Yeah. Here's an interesting question. <laughs> what happens if elders, your parents, don't approve of your partner? What should you do? That is a massive problem. <laughs> <laughs> so I've actually asked this to um, to a rabbi one time because I, I you know, um, I I've, I've had some people who told me, you know, I, I like this person. My parents don't approve for whatever reason. And in Judaism, apparently, you're the rabbi, so you can say when it comes to marriage, you do have the right to decide. You should not disrespect your parents. Um, but from what I understand, I think you're probably better to answer that question. I think in Judaism, you are allowed to make that decision. But like I said, you have to be respectful to your parents, you know, tell them, I want to make you happy and try to, you know, try to convince them in a very nice, kind way. You know, don't tell them, no, I'm marrying them too bad for you. Say, I really like this person. Wouldn't you be happy for me if I was happy? Like the way you say it, you know? You said that a lot tonight. And I think it's a real big takeaway for me, uh, at least, you know, that it's about the way you say it. It's not about what you say and the way you say it. And I'm assuming because you're so passionate about that, you must spend a lot of time teaching how to say something or how to approach something, which I think is really important. It is because it, it's not just about dating. It's about everything. You know, I was a high school teacher for many years. Um, such like amazing, amazing students. And I am guilty of the, you know, the way I would tell them how, how I would discipline them. And then I would try like, you know, the positive way. And suddenly we were like best friends. Uh, so why should it just be in dating? It should be in everything. Yeah, yeah, so good. Here's the next one. Some people say they're not engaged because they're too picky, too scared. But as soon, oh, no, that was enough. No, that we already, we already did that one. Sorry. Okay, next one. Uh, hi, Annie. What hi. happened? <laughs> Uh, what happens if my father is ill um, and he's the one that always gave me guidance and support and without his guidance I don't feel like I can date someone 
So that's a very difficult situation. It's a very, very big challenge. And, you know, in life, we always want our parents to support us. It doesn't matter what we're doing, dating, of course, dating and everything. Um, I would ask them because they are your parents. I would ask them, what's the reason why you think this is not a match for me? Like try to talk it out to see maybe, maybe they want, you know, to you to meet someone who has X, Y, and Z because they think you deserve certain things in life. If it's just that, then you can convince them, you know, they don't have a quality you want me to have in a partner, but they have other amazing qualities. If they tell you, no, I think this person is being very mean to you, you should stop and say, wait, he is my father, he loves me. If this person is not good for me, is mean to me, whatever reason, maybe I'm blinded, you know, love is blind. Maybe, you know, I'm afraid to be single again. Maybe I'm afraid not to meet someone who's great. Like, let me hear why a person who cares about me, because, you could ask your friends, you could ask your coworkers, but really, who would care more about you than your father and right. your mother? <laughs> very, very tough. Wow. Okay, the person told me I did not ask the question, so I will ask it. I apologize. The question is, sometimes people say they're not engaged because they're too picky, too scared. But as soon as they get engaged, we say, that's when Hashem wanted them to find their partner. So is it our issue or is it what Hashem wanted you to get married? Did I not ask this question to you? You asked me, but I think that person maybe wants the, the timing thing answered because we answered other things to that. So I think I know what they mean if they re-asked it. Yeah. Um, I asked myself, you know, why didn't I meet my husband seven years ago? <laughs> you know, I could have, I mean, we liked each other. I, I could have, you know, you're right. There is a certain thing to time in. Um, but in life, in Judaism, there's also such a thing as making an effort. It, it says in the Torah, I will bless the work of your hands. That means you have to do something, <laughs> you know? So, you know, yes, you have to make your effort, but it, at the end of the day, maybe, you know, for those of us who are believers, um, maybe God has a reason why you're not ready. Maybe, maybe you don't even know the reason. Just like if you get uh, refused from a job, like, I got refused from a job 12 years ago. I was so sad and I found a better job that I'm so happy I didn't have that job. So, you know, it, it, it could be the same thing for dating. I told myself, I like this person and they broke up with me. And now looking back, I'm like, it would have been a horrible marriage. Thank God that they broke up because I, you know. So yeah, there is such a thing as timing, but you have to make an effort and, uh, and you have to pray. In Judaism, you know, we pray. <laughs> Are there any other spiritual techniques and tactics that you use that people can do uh, to be able to, to find their Bashar, to buy, to find that one? I have a very interesting story for you. Um, not too long before I met my husband, it was Shabbat and I was walking in a park with a friend and I met a Jewish convert and she was doing like holistic healing, you know, like um, not, you know, non-traditional uh, medicine. And she was so spiritual. I couldn't believe the things that she was saying. And I told her, you know, I'm, I'm looking for my match. Like, you know, I'm praying very hard. What do you think I should do? And she said something I never thought about that like really, really helped me. She said, don't just pray to me the right person. Pray for the well-being of that person. You're going to feel so good because you didn't meet them yet, but you're praying for them that, you know, they're healthy, they're doing well. Um, and you're going to feel really good. So spiritually, um, you know, praying, praying for them. Um, if I could share like a small emotional story. I remember one Friday night, not too long before I met my husband, I was like, wow, he's somewhere, you know, he's not married. Who knows what, whose table he's eating at this Friday night. I pray Hashem, you know, that, you know, he should be happy and encouraged and, you know, he's going to meet the right one soon. And I felt so, so good. And um, praying for the other person also is a very, very big um, comfort. So it's interesting. So you prayed for this guy that you had never met. Wow. That's really, really special. Really special. Here's a, here's a hard question. This is what the person asks. Can we love someone who was in a relationship? Can we make them change their mind? So I would need a bit more detail if it's changing their mind about dating you or about something that you want in another relationship. I have, well, the, the person's here, so they'll, 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 they'll uh, message that. What I'm going to do now, it's, nine, it's 9.30, so uh, what we do now at this point 
is uh, so there's some people who weren't able to make it. So we record the main part of the session that we can send out to those people who registered. Anyone who's registered will get the link to this main recorded session that they could be able to listen to at their own time uh, for whatever reason, if they had to leave early or came late so they can hear this. But what now? We're going to turn off the recorder. We'll allow people to unmute themselves. Whatever happens here stays here. And uh, obviously, uh, one at a time. So for those of you who are listening after the fact, um, sorry, you're not going to hear all the juicy stuff we're going to talk about uh, here. But uh, that's the, one of the joys of being here live with us. So um, I'm going to turn off the recording now.